This is the mock-up in Apple's HomePod advertisement, and this is my DIY build where I recreated the same minimalist setup. And you really wouldn't believe just how much effort was involved in recreating this. When Apple launched the new HomePod, they pitched it as a product that could be used in a stereo pair to create a minimalist home cinema, and had this nice little mock-up of a big screen with two HomePods on a shelf below it. And I actually thought that does look really cool. And when I started learning about how these HomePods actually work to recreate surround sound in your living room by using beam-forming tweeters to bounce the sound off your wall so that you hear the reflection but not the source, I was super interested in how effective this might be. So I decided to go all in and recreate the same kind of looking minimalist home cinema that Apple were using in their marketing there with a super flat flush mounted screen with no wires visible. And instead of the unit for the HomePods to sit on, I decided to go for a floating shelf and I wanted to conceal all the wires across the whole thing. If you're new to this channel, I make videos on design, usability and workflow. And those are things I'm equally passionate about in my day job, where I work on Setseed, which is a white label CMS that helps web design agencies build better websites faster with zero plugins needed. So in this video, I'm going to look at the whole build as well as actually reviewing how effective the HomePods are when used in this way. I think this is exactly the perfect setup for the HomePods where you really value that minimal space saving form factor of the device, but you still really enjoy getting as close as possible to that immersive surround sound experience. So this in theory is a Dolby Vision, Dolby Atmos capable minimalist home cinema. It's really cool and I'm really pleased with the way it turned out. So in our house here, I use our dining room as this YouTube studio, which means we have to have a dining table in our lounge, which isn't a massive lounge in the first place. So basically we've got quite a small living area and we've got this L-shaped sofa and we've always had a wall mounted TV just because there isn't really space for a unit against that wall. So our goal for the living room has always been to create a kind of comfortable, relaxed area. And we never really had a very big screen in that room because we just didn't want the TV to be a dominating part of that room. And because we've got the L-shaped sofa and this is a casual sitting room, we need both the screen and the sound to be as effective as possible wherever you're sat in this space. So for the TV, we really wanted something that would look ultra minimal. I wanted to use this as an opportunity to go slightly bigger in the screen size. So I knew that I had to keep the overall appearance as flat and minimal as possible. So I wanted something that would go right up against the wall and be super thin. So the LG Gallery series is one of the few TVs on the market that actually offers this amazing flush wall mounting form factor. If you've ever seen an LG OLED panel, you'll know they're absolutely fantastic. I actually use a 55 inch LG panel as my computer display as well, just because they're so brilliantly uniform and it lets me use the screen as a 4K retina style screen, but the other side of the room, which I think saves it quite a bit of eye fatigue. So I'm used to how these panels look. And this amazing website, ratings or artings.com, does a lot of really good analysis and comparisons with all the different screens. And the LG OLED TVs all perform really well on their tests as well. So if you want a TV that mounts super flat to the wall like this, that's really thin, there aren't actually very many options on the market. Basically nothing from Sony. Samsung do these frame style TVs, but they're really pretty old basic technology panels. Crucially, they don't have a very good viewing angle, which for something that's kind of sold and marketed as something to replace a picture frame on your wall, I think is a real miss. Of course, the OLEDs from LG have an amazing viewing angle. And this gallery series from LG comes with the most amazing wall mounting system. And I'm going to look into that in more detail in a minute. So next onto the speakers, and of course, there's no surprise what I went for here. But there's some interesting discussion to be had around my criteria, which led me to this point. So normally with a stereo pair of speakers, the sound is actually quite positional. To get the best effect, you generally need to be sat pretty well centered in that stereo speaker. If you go off axis, the treble sound really can change quite dramatically. And of course, if you've gone the whole hog and actually set up a multi-speaker surround sound system in your room, then it's almost even worse because someone somewhere is always going to be sat right next to a speaker. So the further you go down the home cinema rabbit hole, the more important it is that people are sat in exactly the right place. And that's just something that isn't really compatible with a comfortable living room type setup. And that's why the HomePods are such a perfect product for this use case. So compared to the sound that they output, these speakers are absolutely tiny. Most speakers that have a half decent sound tend to be pretty deep front to back, whereas these things are perfectly cylindrical and they can go on an incredibly thin shelf. And the aesthetic of them is really not to be underestimated. Of course, if you don't value that stuff, then there are many, many other options. But this is really a discussion about how far you can go in maintaining a minimal aesthetic in a, in a sitting room environment and still achieve the best possible sound and picture given those constraints. So this warm toned solid oak floating shelf below the HomePods, I think really works well to make this look a much more inviting and less kind of techy setup here. 
And there's some really nice touches with these HomePods, including the lights on the top, which are actually light sensitive. So when you dim the lights in the room for a film experience, which with these OLEDs is actually particularly important because there's so much detail in the darker areas of the screen that you do want your room quite dark to really enjoy the maximum contrast range there. So it's nice to see the little lights on top of the HomePods dimming with the room. And then in the daytime, if you're watching TV or listening to music, those lights are a bit brighter. So what most people don't understand about the HomePods is that they're omnidirectional speakers, and this is fundamentally different to the way most speakers work. Most speakers have just got a single front-facing tweeter, and treble sound is, is usually quite directional from those tweeters. So if you go off axis, the sound changes dramatically. With the HomePods, they've got an array of beamforming tweeters all around the HomePod projecting into the room. So as you move around, your experience with that treble sound doesn't change. So to be clear, I'm actually talking about the sound as perceived from the speakers themselves. And this is most mostly in the mids and treble range of the speaker. There are still issues with standing waves, and a part of me was kind of hoping that the HomePod software would have dealt with that, but it hasn't. You can still detect a big variation in the bass response according to where you're sat in the room, whether you're in a standing wave or not. So this omnidirectional sound really perfectly complements the idea of an OLED panel with this incredible viewing angle. So you can sit anywhere in the room and enjoy the picture and the sound in the best possible way here. And because the HomePods are just to the sides of the screen, you always get a really good experience of the center of the sound coming from the center of the screen. You never find yourself with a rear channel dominating the sound if you're, if you're sat right next to it, and you don't get that shift as you go off axis from a normal stereo pair of speakers. So when you frame this product like this, it becomes clear what a perfect product it is when this is the way that you want to use them. And it's funny how people seem to be confused as to who the HomePods are for. And it's pretty clear to me that anyone with the kind of similar requirements as us has a comfortable living room and they don't want technology to be too much of a dominating part of it, especially if your other half is less interested in technology and all that stuff than you are, then this is really the perfect product here. And another myth, I think, is that the HomePods are only suitable for people who are already embedded in the Apple ecosystem. And I think that's nonsense too, and I'm going to get onto that more in a minute. One of the really good things about the HomePods is how good they are at understanding your voice when you talk to it to use Siri. Now, obviously, Siri is fairly limited as a kind of smart assistant, and things like ChatGPT have really made these smart assistants look incredibly stupid now. But if you forget about the actual kind of question and answer format of what these can do, and actually just focus on its kind of mechanical ability to do things like play and pause and rewind and turn on subtitles and all of that hey, stuff, Siri, turn on the subtitles. its ability to understand your voice, even when you've got the sound up really loud, is really, really good. Of course, the Apple TV is the core of this whole setup, so this is the main stream Almost everything we do on this setup goes via the Apple TV. And I do think the HomePods are pretty useless without the Apple TV. But the Apple TV is a very standalone product in the Apple ecosystem. You could have an Apple TV without being massively embedded in the Apple ecosystem. You can run third-party apps, you could use Spotify for your music, and of course you can use the Siri remote for the Apple TV to control Spotify. Of course it is unfortunate that HomePods don't natively support Spotify, but if that is the music platform you use and, and you've got this Apple TV-based setup, there's really no reason this would get in the way. I use Apple Music, but I don't actually often use Apple Music by voice alone through the HomePods. If I'm sat in the lounge, I'm usually using it via the Apple TV. So I think if you're using it this way, these kind of limitations of the HomePods when you look at them by themselves are not a massive deal breaker because the Apple TV really comes in and fills the gap. The Apple TV is a really mature platform. There are loads of third-party apps from all the different streaming services that you can get on there. So you haven't got to use all the Apple services on there. You can just use whichever app you want if you want to use Netflix and all the rest of it. So you definitely don't need to be heavily using all of the Apple ecosystem to get the best out of this experience. Of course, I do think once you start using the interface on the Apple TV and you see that level of polish and just how good everything looks and the experience is, you'll probably want to switch. And um, I know I'm sounding like a massive Apple fanboy, but you know they're, they are, they're just so good at getting that polish and that rewarding user experience uh, and, I, and I think that counts for a lot obviously this is just my opinion you know I'm heavily in, invested in the Apple ecosystem but I'm just trying to explain like why I've gone that far into this ecosystem I think a lot of people are quite bamboozled by why you would want to be in the Apple ecosystem um, but for me who's in it it's actually wonderful I don't want to leave I know I certainly couldn't leave easily if I wanted to but that's the point I really don't so the Apple TV is obviously the core part of all of this, but it has a really interesting magic trick up its sleeve. So the Apple TV is connected via HDMI using eARC to the TV. And what that means is when the TV is playing another source, the Apple TV can take the audio from that source and still play it out of the HomePods. Now this is absolutely critical. There was a point in time where I thought the Apple TV HomePod setup was kind of hobbled because you couldn't actually play other sources through the telly and get the sound to come out of the HomePods. So the Apple TV is connected via an eARC compatible HDMI cable to the TV. And then the TV is connected via HDMI to our Nintendo Switch. And the Nintendo Switch, when you turn the surround sound mode on 
on on the Nintendo Switch, the TV passes that sound back through the HDMI cable to the Apple TV, and then the Apple TV will send that wireless surround sound to your HomePod. And then you get to enjoy that approximation of its surround sound through the HomePods from the Nintendo Switch, which is just fantastic. So once the Apple TV is part of the picture, it really isn't as much of a closed system as people think. So this is obviously wireless audio to the HomePods. I'm not sure how bad the lag is. When I played the Nintendo Switch, I couldn't perceive any lag at all. My kids certainly didn't notice it. If you're a pro gamer, there may well be some lag there. But again, for our requirements of this being kind of a casual living room setup, any kind of lag when you're using the eARC system there is just a non-issue for us. So if you're not heavily part of the Apple ecosystem, let's say you don't even have an iPhone, you could still have this as your living room setup and you wouldn't feel restricted. You can use any apps on the Apple TV with third-party providers. You don't need to use Apple's music and streaming services. You can use Spotify and Netflix apps on the Apple TV. And of course, because of the eARC support, you can also use third-party boxes and devices and gaming consoles, and you still get the surround sound experience from the HomePods. So there really actually isn't much of a walled garden effect here. Let's take a quick look at how I built this whole system. So we have dot and dab plasterboard walls on this concrete block wall. And the way you put cables behind here is use these kind of carbon fiber rods and you poke the wires down behind. But with it being dot and dab, you're always gonna hit a blob of this plaster. What I've realized with this stuff after messing about for so long is just don't worry about cutting as many holes as you need to in the plasterboard. Isn't it? You, you try and avoid cutting holes and then you end up just wrestling when you hit a blob or a weird angle more. So just cut another hole. Just use a multi-tool to cut out another hole in the plasterboard, cut as many holes as you need to you can make it good afterwards <laughs> that, that's kind of the philosophy I've developed when I'm working with getting wires behind dot and dab plasterboard so what I wanted to do to really maintain this minimalist experience is actually keep all our HDMI sources away from the shelf and the TV. I'm not even keeping the Apple TV box on display and certainly not the Nintendo Switch. So they're off on another unit off to the side of the room with long HDMI cables that go into a hole in the wall behind the plasterboard and then into the TV. So this LG Gallery TV has the most amazing wall mounting bracket. It just it makes the process so simple. So the bracket itself is nice and simple and lightweight. You mount that on the wall, obviously using appropriate fixings um, for the dot and dab plasterboard into concrete block. I'm using Corefix fasteners, which are fantastic. They have a little metal cylinder that bridges the gap between the plasterboard and the block work. They're amazing, really strong, really easy to work with. So basically, once you've mounted the bracket on the wall, the bracket then has a front bit that you can pull away from the wall, which makes it obviously so much easier to get the TV onto the bracket. And the neat thing about this is you can put it back onto the wall and then you can still easily put it off the wall later to access your HDMI ports. So it's very easy to adjust and fiddle about. And the really nice thing about the way the TV mounts into this bracket is you can actually rotate the TV. So it's got these little metal fixings on the back of the screen that, that fit into these eyelets on the wall mount. And then the whole thing can rotate within those eyelets, even when it's got these little safety clips locked over the eyelet so it can't accidentally be lifted out until you open those safety clips. But it's just fantastic to be able to get the TV dead level after you mount it. Of course, it's quite tricky to mount the bracket and get it dead level. So being able to make that small adjustment afterwards is just absolutely brilliant. And there's a strong magnet as well, which pulls it into place. So it sort of pulls itself back onto the wall so that it's dead tight. I just love the way this screen sits onto the wall like this. Now there's one massive caveat with this LG Gallery Series TV and that is that the power cable is permanently fixed to the unit and there's no easy way of getting it out. So you've got the plug on one end which again is not easily removable it's all sort of molded onto the wire and then the wire is is permanently installed into the screen. Obviously you could cut the wire, but then I imagine you're gonna have a massive headache if you wanna make a warranty claim. So I didn't wanna take the plug off. Of course that makes it very difficult to conceal the wires behind the plasterboard. I can't obviously pull the plug end of the wire through behind the plasterboard to get it to come out somewhere else. So what I'm doing is using the shelf as a way of concealing all of this and we're gonna look more at that in a second. The only real solution is to cut out the section of plasterboard and then put conduit in there and then put the wire in there and then make it good over the top of that. So what I decided to do was just do that in between the shelf and where the screen is. And then I'm only working with a, a small distance where I've got to do that with the wire. So I then installed a socket on the underside of that shelf and I routed out a section of the wood to make the socket sit as sort of flush as possible within the wooden shelf. So the plug is on the underside of the wooden shelf and then the wire goes up through behind the plasterboard back into the TV. And then all the surplus wire is actually just looped up behind the plasterboard behind the TV. So basically it's an unbelievable amount of effort just to conceal essentially two inches of cable between the screen and the shelf. But of course, if you didn't do that, the whole kind of minimalist look would be shattered. And this whole project really did seem like quite a giant effort, but I do think it's worth it. I think once you get all those cables out of the way, you're left with this ultra minimal setup is fantastic. So in terms of the shelf itself, I actually considered using 
having sort of two smaller shelves to the sides of the screen for the HomePods because I knew that I wasn't actually having anything else on the shelf. But I thought actually the aesthetic of just having a single flat shelf below the screen it would work quite well and it offers that kind of protection for the screen as well in front. You know, you can't just sort of walk up and smash yourself into the screen. So on my previous setup, I still had a floating shelf and I used these weird bolts that go into a big hole that you drill into the shelf itself and then you adjust that with cams and they're quite good for making the shelf totally level and all the rest of it but again a major hassle and I really wanted to avoid those kinds of fixings for this shelf so I just went with these standard concealed brackets and unfortunately they have actually sagged I, I'm not quite sure where that sag is again they're using the core fix fixings through the dot and dab so they should be definitely firmly mounted into the concrete block behind the dot and dab but somewhere along the lines there is a little bit of play and the shelf has sunk a little bit but essentially they're quite concealed brackets I think probably in hindsight I might have just gone for a visible bracket and had done with it I really was just kind of wrapped up in having this floating invisible mounting system for the for the shelf but some nice simple decent brackets are probably a simpler solution that would result in a perfectly level shelf so the shelf is doing a lot of work to help conceal all of these cables so obviously the two HomePod power cables uh, need to be concealed so what they do is they disappear down a hole in the shelf and then I routed a groove for those and then the wire goes straight into the back of the socket which is used for the TV and those wires are just wired into the terminals in that socket and with the HomePod 2 they've given us an easily removable power cable which any figure eight end kind of power cable works with so I've saved the originals in the box for if I ever sell these or whatever and just replace those with normal power cables that I've cut the plugs off so I can poke the wire down a very small hole in the shelf and then obviously connect the wires to the terminals in the socket underneath and conceal all the wires in the routed grooves. It's always really surprising people's reactions when they see this setup. It looks so clean and minimal now you wouldn't think how much effort had gone into making it like this you know getting the router out and sawdust everywhere and holes in the plasterboard and painting and decorating afterwards it's just <laughs> a massive massive amount of work to get this ultra minimal look and no one ever looks at it and knows how much effort you put into making it like this but there is something really satisfying about going to this kind of length to conceal the kind of raw workings of the setup hiding all of the cables and all the rest of it so you're just left with those human facing components the screen and the speakers that make the picture and sound everything else that goes into making it work is completely hidden from view Let's talk a little bit about the sound quality itself. So I actually had high hopes that these new HomePods were going to do something really clever to solve standing waves in the room. I've always been annoyed by this acoustic effect whenever I have speakers in any of our sort of small house rooms. I'm always sat right next to a wall. And what that tends to mean is you're sat in an area where you either get a really heavy bass or a really reduced bass because of the standing wave that bounces back off the wall. And because you're right next to it, the effect of it is quite dramatic. And that's still the same. Unfortunately, the, the, the length of our room between where we sit and where the speakers are is just at the right distance to get quite a heavy bass amplification in that kind of two feet where our ears are uh, in relation to the wall behind us. If I lean forward into the middle of the room, the effect completely disappears and you, you don't get that boominess. And unfortunately, with the HomePod 2, this still happens exactly the same as with any other speaker I've tried in this room. So it's just something I've had to get used to. When I first got it, I was experimenting asking Siri to turn down the bass, which it can do. And you know, in some situations, I sort of felt that like that worked, but I'm now just used to it being on all the time. And I just live with that sort of sound signature that our room has associated with it. But it does just reinforce the fact that there's no point in spending loads of money on real audio files quality speakers if you're just using it in a reasonably small room with no sound treatment you know until you get involved with bass traps or large rooms with both you and the speakers well away from those walls then you're going to have this issue and again this is why I think the HomePods work so well for this setup because they offer sound quality that's as good as kind of most people's rooms would allow for at a price point that still actually undercuts all of the big fancy sound bars and other things that are sold for people who are kind of pursuing a home cinema style experience without too much clutter. So the sound from the HomePods is remarkable for their size. I think it, it really is amazing. You know, it's not super loud, but it's definitely as loud as I'd ever want being in this semi-detached house. I'm basically never having it over 50%. And from people who have done proper tests on these, it seems that over about 70%, the sound signature changes anyway and the bass falls off. So you've got about up to 70% where you get the full kind of quality that these are capable of. So I'm very happy that I don't need to go over 50% for our kind of comfortable maximum listening level in our room. So I think interestingly, I think the mid-range is a real standout quality of the HomePods. I'm pretty confident that that mid-range is better represented here for things like vocals and dialogue in music and films than any kind of soundbar package. So essentially they're doing the jack of all trades thing, but they're doing it really well. Obviously they're not going to compete with proper hi-fi audio stereo speakers when you're sat directly in the middle in a perfect acoustic room and all the rest of it. And nor would they compete with a proper dedicated multi-channel, multi-speaker surround sound system. But for something that occupies this amount of space in your room at this price what they do offer is absolutely remarkable. 
I don't think there's anything else on the market that offers what these do, and that's mainly down to how they deal with surround sound. So in terms of surround sound, I think this is where these things really separate themselves from sound bars and the lower end multi-channel surround sound systems. And with those lower end multi-channel surround sound systems, I've always felt they really are poor for music. And, you know, I've, kind of, I've experimented with a few of those over the years, and they've just always been such a letdown for music in a way that these HomePods just aren't. And of course, the surround effect isn't as good as a channel with rear speakers with those speakers behind you. But of course, as soon as you introduce real dedicated rear speakers, then you're stuck with the problem of where people are sat in the room again. So the idea with the HomePods is they will create your surround sound channels virtually by bouncing the sound for those channels off your walls so that it sounds like they're coming from as close to behind you as possible. So the HomePods know where they're positioned. They know which side of the HomePod is against a wall. And then because they've got this omnidirectional beam forming tweeter array, so what they do is take the sound that should be coming out of your surround sound rear channels and side channels and all the rest of it, bounce that sound off the wall behind the HomePods and to the sides of the HomePods so that you hear the reflection of that sound and it sounds really very much like it is coming from, I don't know, probably coming from here. It's not really ever sounding like it's directly from behind me, but it certainly sounds like it's coming from the sides. And I think this effect is going to be largely dependent on what kind of room and how far away your walls are. In our living room, we've got, actually got the glass French doors to our left and the surround effect is noticeably clearer and louder on the left than it is on the right where of course we've got the rest of the room over into the dining area so the wall on our right is further away and you can definitely hear that difference so the way this works is really clever because the idea with beam forming speakers is that you don't hear the source you can point a sound in a direction and someone outside of that direct focus wouldn't hear the sound so that's essentially what these beam forming tweeters are doing to beam the sound around the room so of course the source of the sound is still in front of you it just happens to be pointing to the back walls but you won't hear the source you'll only hear the reflection and that's how it works that's where the technology in these things is really quite fascinating and I'm absolutely certain that the surround effect that you do hear from these is definitely not something that you're just kind of wishful thinking you know oh that sounds quite good you know it's it's a hundred percent there my kids will notice and turn their heads you know in in shock just without me suggesting to them that they're listening to surround sound it's definitely noticeable and directional enough to be quite obvious in the room we were watching Transformers 2 actually and that's a really good example there's so much amazing surround sound stuff going on in that film and you know just the sound stays Stage feels enormous and, and you do hear these sounds coming from the side and all around and these home pods are capable of amazing rich bass and the dialogue is so crystal clear and just for something this size in your living room I'm actually super thrilled with it and all of this beam forming tweeter stuff means it's very easy to overlook the significance of the hardware in these and that's what makes all of this possible so essentially for anyone who's interested in kind of preserving a minimalist kind of look to their living room without filling it with technology but still appreciates high quality picture and sound uh, for watching films and listening to music I think this setup is a really really good one and I don't think there's anything else on the market that comes close to it for the price it's really surprising how well the HomePods fit this role even for someone who isn't embedded in the Apple ecosystem but it is important that you're looking at it the right way if you go into it expecting them to outperform dedicated stereo speakers in an ideal listening environment or outperform a dedicated surround sound multi-channel setup of course you're going to be disappointed you have to have that balance of expectations in the right place if you want to see a little bit more about what the Apple ecosystem can offer, watch this video next where I look at all the day-to-day real-life uses for my Apple Watch Ultra, and I'll see you there.